Okay, this is the uh, fourth and final session of this series of classes of Hashem. Um, actually called Need for Inspiration. Uh, trying to understand in terms of the whole Pesach experience. Pesach has now come and gone. It's behind us. Uh, hopefully most of the cleaning up is also behind us. Three weeks of work, one week of eating, one week of you know, enjoying the Chag. Um, and then you move on, and uh, we we you know, we we mentioned in Davin Zman Cheres said every time I say those words in Davin and mentioning Zman actually well, Davin Zman Cheres say the time of our freedom, and I guess that, that most people don't really feel, you know, that means that much today. Once upon a time we were Mitzrayim, so we understood freedom. Jews who who survived the Holocaust when it was finally over, understood the concept of freedom. But most of us today have grown up in a pretty free society. Not everything is possible to do, but a lot is possible to do. And uh, you know, certainly religious freedom is something that we, we enjoy today much more than, than probably almost any generation has enjoyed, except the times that we were back in Israel. And we had full control of our, 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 our country and our politics, and it was run by Torah for the most part. But uh, you know, other than that, you know, I think most, most Manchet was saying at this point in time was just paying off all the bills from Pesach and finally escaping all, you know, all the extra charges. And all. It's, it's not what it used to be, but the truth is it's supposed to be. And it's a missed opportunity. Sometimes, you know, as they say, less is more. And sometimes more is less, meaning that all the freedom that we have today kind of distracts us away from the freedom that we can have and, and, and don't realize that we're actually enslaved in many ways that we can't appreciate that uh, only when you finally understand, but on perspective, understand what it really means to be free in the full sense of the term, at least from a Torah perspective. So there is another way to look at the concept of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, the going out of Egypt, as the battle for spiritual inspiration. Parozain, right, the Medrash says, with Avodas Parach, right, the backbreaking work that he's imposed upon us that caused us to struggle and to suffer so much, was not just to get us to build cities and things like that because he wanted to expand you know, the, the, uh, the, the welfare of the Egyptian people, but he was, he was after something you know, more, more specifically to do with, with the Jewish people themselves. He was trying to break them. And the main thing he was trying to do, the Medrash says, was to sap the Jewish people of all spiritual inspiration so that they would default to being his servants. You see, the people become zombies. People, uninspired people, you know, they're, they're pliable. And you can, you, know, you can do almost anything with them, or at least you can manipulate them and move them around. People who are inspired tend to have a lot of energy and want to do what they're inspired to do. The Yitzhah works the exact same way every day of a person's life. We don't realize it, how much, how uninspired people are on a day-to-day -day basis, and they live that way, get used to it. That's just the way it is. Inspiration drives a person in life, clearly. A person has to not only believe in what they're doing uh, in order to be able to continue what they're doing, but they have to be inspired by it. Reaching a goal cannot, cannot be the only pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. The journey itself has to be laced with joy, as it says in Tehillim, even though it's Hashem B'Simcha, to serve a Baruch in joy, because, because without the joy, you're not serving Kosh Baruch B'Simcha with the joy, you're not really serving Him at all in the end. It's with the joy itself, that's, that's what you're serving Kodesh Baruch with, that Simcha is really what you're offering up to Kodesh Baruch that's the Korban that you're giving to Kodesh Baruch And if it's not there, you know, then, then basically you're, you know, you're just falling to this, this mode of being Yotze, right? Doing what I have to do, being a loyal servant, a good servant, you know, or a minimal servant, you know, whatever it takes. I show up, you know, for Shacharis at you know, a certain time that's acceptable to me, hopefully to Hashem as well. And I daven and I say the words and I try to have some, you know, minimal kavana for the, for the words themselves. But, you know, to put myself into it, like it's the last time I'm going to daven in my life, God forbid, like this is the last one. This is my last opportunity to talk to Kodesh Baruch before going, crossing the line and, and going to the next world. What would that feel look like? You know, how, would it, how would it sound? You see on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, it's a different tefillah. 
So people accept it and say, well, you know, of course, I mean, everyone knows that Rosh Hashanah is a special time. You have a din, you have Kippur, it's, you know, it's, it's a day of Kippura, you know, it's an, a, a once in a year opportunity. Of course, you're going to put yourself more into be more inspired by the davening. But it's the only around. It's like, this is to show you what davening can be like. Because Baruch has given you a taste of what it means to daven inspired and to live inspired. And then you're supposed to go ahead and you're supposed to, um, to replicate that on your own in whatever you're doing. Uh, so that's, that's, that's what Paro, that's what the Yitzhahara tries to take away from us. It's constantly trying to, you know, to, to de-inspire us, to take away the inspiration because it knows that without inspiration, we're not going anywhere. We're not going to accomplish too much in life. And one of the, the mistakes that people make is they think that it's a horror doesn't want us to be firm. Well, that's true. It's a horror would prefer we run off and be secular and leave God behind and, and live, live with abandon 100%. But it will accept the fact that you are religious if it knows it can't change that and just try and kill you within the, the framework of your serving a Kodesh Baruch Hu. So he'll do whatever he can to take away that inspiration. So the first thing you have to know, really, is that there are two types of inspiration. Because there's two types, there's two parts to a human being. There's the body and the soul. And both the body and the soul, in general, tend to be inspired by different things. You know, the body tends to be inspired by things that are fleeting. You know, you know, you know a good steak, a, a good time, a good trip, a good vacation, something you know, physically pleasurable. That we that we know we enjoy that our brain you know brain sends off endorphins telling us this is a a great thing let's let's replicate this duplicate it. let's have more of this in our lives you know you can always tell how much natural joy people have in a society by how how committed how how addicted they are to physical pleasures the more a society depends upon physical pleasure and entertainment and things like that to be able to provide them with a sense of joy whether it's clothing, whether it's food, restaurants, whether it's movies, whatever the case may be. But the more society requires these things to be able to have a sense of inner peace and inner joy, that shows you how much is lacking. People who have natural inspiration, natural inner joy, they really believe what they're doing, don't require those things. I always talk about how children, right, they get up first chance they can. The moment they wake up, they stand up and hold on the edge of the crib, waiting to be taken out to explore the world. And they have a tough time going to bed at nighttime. They like literally drop from exhaustion before they'll go to sleep because life is fascinating. Life is inspiring for them. The rest of us, like, don't bother me. Let me sleep as long as I can. And the first things I can to, you know, get back into bed again, believe me, I'm there. And then in the day, <laughs> I'm up as long as I have to be to accomplish what I have to, you know, do. And then we take some, you know, we pepper that with some trips and things like that along the way. But uh, for the most part, you know, life, not the same thing. When you start to grow up, you start to become, you know, an adult with responsibility and you lose track of your potential in life and et cetera, et cetera. So then you're also, you're also burdened by responsibility. At least that's the way it feels. That's the way people tend to look at it. It's a burden, right? I have to do this. It's called old Mahu Shemaim. An old, you put him to cow, so he plows and pulls things. But as the rabbis point out, the word old is used specifically. Because the truth is, is that the cow, if it wasn't for the old, a cow would sit there in a the field the entire day just chewing grass and mooing away. That would be his whole life. At least with the old, he could be used to plow the field and, you know, and plant some seeds and grow some food. And it's made his life much more meaningful in the end. I mean, he doesn't know that. He doesn't really care. But in terms of using the physical world, this is something that we're supposed to learn from in the end. So we have all mahu shemaim, the, the yoke that's on us, right? That's to, to, to allow us to be able to tap into potential that otherwise will go unused. And that's the biggest, biggest shame, perhaps, of you know, society in this world. You know, how, how, many, how many classes, how many schools ever talk about personal potential? Now, to tell us what it is and how to access it. How many times... You get, you know, spoken in the course of your education where someone stops and says, listen, folks, okay, we're going to teach you X, Y, and Z. But, but when it's all said and done, you just have to ask yourself one question. Have I achieved personal greatness? My Rosh Hashiva, Rav, Rav Noach Weinberg, I mean, he, he, used to, he used to come after us all the time with this. He used to like, you know, he was a little you know, affectionate slap across the cheek, but he, he'd cheek and he'd say, you can be great. You can do great things. 
right? And there's a lot of people out there today that went through Eishat Torah doing great things. And one of the reasons why, because they were told to do that. They were told they can be great. And, and, some, and, and, he, you, and he, he made you believe in it to put you in touch with it. But you know, the body, you know, it's, it's, it's not really inspiration. The body's not really inspired. It's more like it's encouraged. It's more like it, it's tempted. It's more like it's, 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 it's pulled in the direction of something. You want to have a good time, right? You want to taste something delicious? You want to be entertained? That's the body's inspiration. But all those inspirations, they don't last very long. They don't lead to too much, which is why we have to keep going back for more and for more and for more and for more. It's amazing how when you've had a wonderful spiritual experience, how you can still taste it even, even hours, maybe days, even weeks after, even years after. There are spiritual experiences that I've had in my life and spiritual experiences you had in your life that you can look back on today fondly and still, still draw from them. And they've built you and they carry you. But the physical ones I've had, every time I think about them, there's like a, my body goes, I want more. Can we go back and do that again? Right? Oh, I wish I could do that all over again. Like somehow it doesn't carry through. It's an experience. And you, maybe you're glad you did it, but it's not the same thing. The body is not inspired to be great. The body is inspired to have pleasure, to have fun, to enjoy yourself. Above all, the body is inspired by comfort. It wants to be comfortable. It's part of a survival instinct also, but that's what the body wants. The famous old line, what's the opposite of pain? And people will tell you it's pleasure, right? They, as if they don't go together. But the truth is the opposite of pain is comfort. And as we know in life, so very often, the greatest pleasures in life often come with pain, through pain. But we don't call it pain so much. We call it self-sacrifice. That athlete who's out there running 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, who, you know, you know I have a friend who, 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 who competes in these Ironman uh, or did, he went you know, in these Ironman uh, competitions. Grueling. There is no obligation. He's a doctor. He doesn't need it for the money. He doesn't ex expect to be a, a, a champion, you know, uh, competitor and, and, make, and go to the Olympics. That's not the point over here. He is personally you know, doing it to himself. He wants to go there's something, you know, in, in that that he wants to get from it. But, you know, that's the body. That's the body. Except there's also an aspect of soul there as well, as we'll see. What does a soul want? What inspires the soul? Right? What's really, that's really the, the main point. We're like, what is it about that, 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 that the soul is, is longing for and being driven that, that inspires it? Well, the truth is, Everybody, that the soul itself, right? When man was made, but Selim Elohim in the image of God, it's not talking about the body. That's clear. The body is a vehicle to be able to allow us to express our Selim Elokus, the godliness with which we were created. But the actual basis, the actual aspect of our Selim Elokus itself, of our, our being made in the image of God, that's the soul. Right? And the soul itself wants to fulfill it, wants to feel it, wants to be real with that. Right, So this, the soul itself, the most important thing to the soul is personal fulfillment. It's like you, know, you wouldn't show up to a college course and just sit there and waste your time. It would be, you know, even if you were having a good time the whole way through, we, if, at the end of three years, you know, and you're graduating four years, five years, and you don't even pass the exams. You fail the exams. At the, end of the, at the end of the college course, you would you would feel literally as if as if you wasted your time. It was it just wouldn't be meaningful in the end. So you know, you want you want to feel accomplished to to go through all of life, even though you have a good time. It may be a lot of fun to do a lot of things, but the end of life, you reach the end. Even though a person thinks, well, you know, as long as I live with, I leave with a smile on my face, what could be better than that? You know, it's like, uh, I've, I've done it all. I, I, I was able to be successful in business and I had fun. But at the end of life, at the end of life, you know, there's a story, a little bit sensitive a story to tell, but, but uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting point that, you know, that I heard. I mean, I knew the story personally. Because uh, it was, yeah, it was very fascinating. Somebody who was a, a secular Jew was completely secular, had no connection to Judaism whatsoever. He had been married once to a Jewish woman, and then they got divorced. He was married a second time to a non-Jew. Now it didn't bother him at all. I mean, he did it. It was not a problem. As far as his, you know, his children from the first marriage were Jewish, 
But he, the second marriage, he, you know, he, you know, didn't he, he didn't wasn't affiliated. It wasn't like he was he was taking a shot at Judaism. He just didn't have a connection. Didn't matter to him. And then at the around the age of fifty, he was a very successful businessman. But unfortunately, at the age of fifty, he, he got cancer, and it was literally within one year, I think, for the time that he found out to the time he actually died. The interesting thing is that someone I didn't know myself personally, but someone I know personally knew him, and was actually a close friend of his, and he told me, and I was very surprised to hear this, that that in his final month, he actually he wouldn't actually see his his wife the second wife, and instead called for a rabbi and began to talk about what he could do to make amends for what he had done by marrying some marrying outside the faith. And like, where is this coming from? Where is this coming from? Like, you know, he, he had no connection, no affiliation whatsoever. It wasn't like he, his parents, you know, they knew and he always felt guilt. No, it's like, it was perfectly okay in his circles and where he came from. So then what changed all of a sudden? Because now as you're, as you're approaching death, it's certain that death is around the corner. It's clear that he was dying. You start to wonder, you know, what if, I mean, everyone's heard about the afterlife. And if, even if they haven't heard of it, they wonder about it. People have a sense of it. You know, what if there is a thing called the day of judgment? What if there is a thing called Judaism and there's this thing that, about not marrying us of the faith, etc.? What about it? What if that's the case? What if that's all real and true? And people start thinking about that. The same thing is true for every individual. That's just one thing that he did wrong. But what about the rest of us? I can thank God people who don't marry outside of Judaism, they marry inside. But, but nonetheless, when a person comes close to their time of death, you know, what did I do? What did I accomplish? If I went today, could I feel as if I reached, you know, or you're not going to reach your potential because that's it's unlimited. But did I did I accomplish? Did I, did I actually try? to access my, my potential and achieve personal fulfillment? Because that's what the soul wants. That's what it means to, be, to live in the image of God. It's not just the idea of a discernment, which is part of it, as we discussed before in the past. It's not just the idea of being noble 100%. It's all part of being a seminal king. But one of the most important parts of, of living in the image of God is that God excels. He is greatness. Everything he does is 100% perfect because he's God, right? But the rest of us, okay, we don't have the capacity to be you know, that, that perfect like that, but we do have the capacity to be able to strive for personal greatness, and we'll want to know that we did. That's what inspires the soul. So the question is, you know, you know, what, you know what is inspired? What, what does it to you know, how, what do we? What do we you know, need to hear? What do we need to see? What is it specifically in life? That we can latch onto or at least expose ourselves to that will allow us to be able to, you know, to, to have that type of soul inspiration and then go ahead and become great. So, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I, I personally find this fascinating. I'm not the only person to make this point, but I think it's a very important point to be made because nothing is accidental, even though we don't always participate and really shouldn't participate in everything the rest of the world is doing. There is something to be learned from it, and you know, as a as a person growing up in secular society, I you know I watched the programs and I saw the you know the I read the comic books about all these superheroes things like that you know Superman and Batman and all these different things you know that that most of us grew up with you know going through the sixties and seventies when it was a lot cleaner and a lot more simpler a lot nobler right but what's interesting see back then it was you know it's such an it's still early in history but still close to world war ii world war ii as are most world wars more than really two officially but you know, but but major wars and catastrophes tend to reboot history tend to reset the clock so to speak regage mankind we tend to become more conservative once again the 1920s going into the 30s very liberal very liberal Right, and then that led, you know, leads to, to war and things like that for a specific reason. Because basically, when you know people are that liberal, they tend to be, you know, self-focused. And the more self-focused you are, the less concerned you are about things in the world, and the less you want to be involved. You know, you know, Chamberlain comes back after meeting Hitler, who clearly states his purpose in his books and his way of thinking, and says, "Peace and our time." Okay, everyone, everyone knew it wasn't that way. Winston Churchill knew it wasn't it wasn't going to be like that, but no one would listen because no one wanted to hear. FDR, the United States of America, was a, was a thirty what the thirty seventeenth, you know, military power at the time because they, 
they demilitarized after World War I. They didn't want anything to do with it. And when Winston Churchill called up and said, I need help, they, they, well, we signed the pact. We can't really do it. We can't, you know. And then, of course, when it came right down to it, they got burned, you know, bombed in Pearl Harbor, burned terribly over there, and that forced them to get into the war, and it probably cost them a lot more money to, to get back into things, become the, the largest military power, had, the, had they been already maintaining that from World War I. And, of course, in the end, 72 million people died, you know, including the 6 million in the Holocaust, and, and a lot of those are Americans, too. So, you know, the, the, that's what happens. And then comes the war and people become you know, more real with life. You, you, you live with death for so many years now. You have to witness the, and have the fear of it. And so people tend to become more conservative once again. But then it gets, you know, more liberal. Time. And we're already at that stage again with the 1920s where things are very liberal and very self-centered. They're very self-focused. And not just that, but they're, they're smashing the old icons. They're even, <laughs> un, it's unbelievable. I mean, these things only happened in Germany in the past and in Russia with the uproot history. And they tried to rewrite it to suit their, their needs, their, their way of thinking. That is happening in, in the United States of America is absolutely mind-boggling and very historic, too, for that matter. But that's what's going on. So it's very strange, I think, personally, it's very strange in this day and age that we're living in right now that superheroes should be at the forefront of all what's going on, although they're now starting to distort and pervert and all these different things like that. I've, I've been told what's, what's going on today is, is, is trying to match the times. But until today, you had these people who, in general, what were they like? They were simple people, a lot of them, not everybody, but most of them. They built themselves up. They're self-sacrificing. They're humble. They don't take credit. They give their lives for other people. And all, all these Torah values. And the, and the amazing thing is how many people spend good money to go watch it on the screen and read the books to be entertained. But it's, it's more than entertainment. It's more than just being entertained. And yet it's making billions upon billions of dollars. And you know why? Because most people, whether they realize it or not, sit there. And as they're watching this thing take place on the screen, knowing it's not real, but suspending their belief for the course of two hours of time or however they're reading the book, it's talking to something inside of them. They relate to this. It's what I would call the messianic complex or the messiah complex. Most people have it. Everybody really basically has it. This innate desire to do something really great on behalf of mankind and save the world. Ah, we crush it, we, we become overly practical, and we don't you know, take it seriously after a while, but it's in there. You know, I, when I was at a, a Shabbaton once in, uh, I think it was New Jersey, actually it was in Shabbaton, it was an AJOP conference, it stands for the, Amer the Association of, Jew of Jewish Outreach Professionals. And it was a conference that people got together once a year, I don't know if they still do it, but uh, especially with Corona, but they, once a year we got together, it was, it was a lot of fun. You know, outreach organizations would get together in a hotel someplace in the States for you know, a weekend or so, or, you know, for two or three days. The food was great. The entertainment, you know, people were great. And, and then you shared your, your lessons, your knowledge that you gained in outreach. And we could all work together to bring back as many Jews as possible. Very, very fascinating. Some things more than others. Right? And, uh, you know, it was a, it was a very interesting time. And while I was there, I happened to be wandering through the halls of the hotel, right? Just going through, you know, on the way to the to one of the rooms that the the conference was taking place in. But there was another another, you know, uh, conference going. Not so much a conference, but a uh, a presentation. It was by Tony Robbins. I'd heard about him. I didn't know exactly what he. I, I knew that he was a very popular speaker, but not more than that. I don't know if you remember Tony Robbins, but one of the first motivational speakers, I think like $35,000 a shot to come speak for an hour or two. And he was speaking in the hotel, the door was open. So I actually stood there by the door for a few seconds to watch him on, you know, on stage, you know, talk to people. And it was a little mesmerizing. It was, you know, he wasn't saying things so, so complicated things I didn't really know. Maybe the people in the audience weren't so familiar, but Tor talks about these things all the time. But it was clear, even for the few minutes that I was able to listen to what he was talking about, you know, he basically what he was he was talking to people's 
own personal sense of greatness inside of them. He was trying to get into their heart, trying to inspire them. That's what he's trying to do. A motivational speaker, somehow, what, what do they do? What, like, they don't change the way you look. They don't change the way you dress necessarily. What do they do? They say things that somehow are supposed to, are supposed to awaken within you this, this, this willingness to go out and do something fantastic that, that you, know, you otherwise wouldn't do, right? And in, in the process of doing so, accomplish great things and not be afraid of the results. So that's what all these things do. These movies and these, and these you know, stories and these motivational speakers, they're talking to a person's innate desire to be great. And that's what the soul wants. Now, if it's greatness, because if I were to save the world like that, I would become famous and they'd all love me and pay me lots of money, and I'd be on talk shows, right? That's the body talking. That's not the soul. But if the, if the person says no, because I just know that it's fulfilling. I will feel great about living in my life if I'm able to go out and do something very, very noble and, and, and be able to change the world in whatever way I can in a positive, you know, in a positive direction my life will feel meaningful at that point in time. And we see it all the time. Even just helping somebody else with a chesed. They need our help. We could walk away. We help instead. Or we just, you know, we have a, we have a Yetzirah to do something. We don't do it. In, you know, instead, we do the, the nobler thing. It makes us feel more ourselves. I mean, how many times in the course of your day do you really feel like you are who you are, who you're meant to be? In the course of your life. Sometimes you have these amazing moments, and they don't come very often. At least I don't think they come very often. But these amazing moments where where everything just lines up, and you say, "You feel, wow, this really feels good to be me, doing this." This, you know, I didn't know I had the potential to to, to even do this, to act this way. Most of the time, we're we're acting and reacting, we're being bumped around and you know responding, and it's like we're not really being the full people we can possibly be. And as you get older. Right, which most of us are doing. <laughs> We're all doing it, but but when you're young, you know, it's amazing how many things matter to you. But as you start getting older and your energy starts to wane, it's amazing how many things that used to matter to you don't matter to you as much anymore. How many times it's like, ugh, I can't I just don't have the energy to get involved, in it, the energy to, to 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 care about that anymore. And you start like whittling down your priorities. And what becomes important in the end, hopefully, if you're if you're a soul-driven individual, then what would, will become important are those things that prepare you for the next stage of life, doing the noble thing, being the good example, whatever the case may be. So this is what you know motivational speakers do. This is what, what the Tory is the greatest motivational speaker that we have, so to speak. I mean, what is what is the Torah doing? The Torah starts off by saying that we are made with Salam Elohim. It lays the groundwork. That's who you are. As the Rizal points out, right on the first page of Shar HaGilgulim, Gate of Reincarnations, a person is the soul, not the body. The body is clothing for the soul. Even though you look in the mirror, you see the body. You don't see the soul. You only see the soul when you do a mitzvah, when you're self-sacrificing. Then you can see the soul somewhat. But the most of the time, it's just the body leading, and the soul providing the, the energy and the life, life force. 99.9% .9 of the people in the world today believe that they're a body, not a soul. Even the ones that believe they have a soul. Because basically, we don't spend time to try to figure out what it is that we want as souls versus the body, to know when we're being true to ourselves, we're not being true to ourselves. So the Torah is a huge help. That's for sure. The Torah can like, like, you know, like, like pulling teeth, the Torah pulls out some of our greatness because it makes up, we're cheaters. We're cheaters, the Jewish people, but in a good kind of a way. Right, because because my counterpart, my secular counterpart, or my you know non-Jewish you know counterpart, doesn't always have to get up at seven o'clock in the morning. And if he does, he can just go and take a cup of coffee, sit down, read the newspaper, and do not much more than that if he wants to. And no one's going to criticize him because he's done nothing wrong, right? But I can't do that. The halacha says so. The Torah says so. I listened to the rabbis, the rabbis have told me, I have to go to shul. 
There are things that I, that I have to do first thing in the morning. I have to get up and say, Mo de Do I feel like saying Mo de No, I don't feel like saying anything first thing in the morning. I, you know, I don't like talking. So I don't feel like showing my gratitude first in the morning. Right? On the contrary, why'd you wake me up? Right? Can I sleep a little bit longer? Right? But I have to. God's watching. And I know that he takes note. Right? So I, you know, I got a shoe, I got a dove, I have to wake up. I can't just sleep through the entire thing. I mean, some people do when they, but, but I, I, I can't do it. Right? And I have to, you know, behave a certain way. Now, I don't live up to all those ideals, but at least I'm aware of them. At least I know they're there. And on the rare occasion, somehow when all the things line up just right, I can do it. I can, I can do that nobler thing. I can do that soul-like thing. But for the, the course of my day, I'm constantly being told me I had to get up from my work today before sundown to get to Minyan on time to Daven Mincha with a seaboard. With a, with a minion. Now, I got to tell you, during coronavirus for the for about six months, I wasn't going to shul. You know how nice it was to get up from my desk and just turn around and daven over here <laughs> by the stender? You know, it was like, it's behind the wall over here, right? It's like, that. You know, this was my this was my base medrash. It was my bay knesset. It was my office. And I also took naps here too. You know, this 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 it was like such an easy thing to do. <laughs> and I could, you know, and for a while we had a minion you know, with my, my neighbors, right? They were in the balconies. I'm downstairs here. And we sort of like met a minion from across the road over here. And, and no one had gone anywhere. Just walk at the front door. Very convenient. <laughs> but then eventually got to a point, I was Shana, you know, specifically, where it seemed like I had to go back to shul once again. Now it's a whole, I had to get dressed up to go back to shul again and be there on time and, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. And my body's like, you know, schlepping it out. It doesn't want to do, you know, don't bother me. But I know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm old enough to know already, experienced enough to know that, that when I do all that, it makes me better. I'm doing a better thing. I mean, there have been times in my life where basically I took the easy way out. Lots of times, lots of times, right? Sometimes with justification, most of the time, probably not. But I spent a lot of time rationalizing, justifying after. You know why? It doesn't, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel right. I got away with it. You know, I used to, I used to you know, sleep in, in the old days, you know, I struggle to get out of bed on time, you know, in the morning to make a minion. But I also hated getting there late. I also hated, you know, I got there late. I'm throwing on my tefillin, my talus, you know, actually I didn't have a talus at that time, but my tefillin the last second, right? And I got to catch up and I can't say Pazuka to Zimre as fast as everybody else. The introductory presumption, I'm, stu- I'm stumbling over my tongue getting frustrated by the second and cursing myself, kind of, like, why didn't you get up on time? Well, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And after a while, I would sleep in, but a voice would go, you know how you're going to feel later on today. No, I won't. Yes, you will. No, I won't. The argument in my head, it goes, it gets so loud, I have no choice but to get up. I can't sleep with all that noise taking place inside my Because you learn. It just feels better to do the right thing. It feels better to do the, the, the soul thing, the nobler thing. And so the Torah does exactly that. All the Torah mitzvahs are just custom designed to fight against the Yetzirah. They ask the question, will there be mitzvahs in the Messianic era? One opinion says, yes, all the mitzvahs will be there. <laughs> One opinion says, no, they won't be there. And they both bring verses to prove their point. And the Leshem, Roshulam Eliyashu, who loves to to, to show how no one's really arguing in the end, even though it looks like they are, says that they're not, they're not really disagreeing with, you know, with each other. They're both right. How can they both be right? <laughs> how can it be that there's no mitzvahs and there are mitzvahs? So it explains. The mitzvahs, the actions that we call mitzvahs, are eternal. They'll, they'll always be there in some form, even in the world to come. The way we do it today, Will I always be putting on black boxes, black leather boxes for tefillin? No, that's for now. But later on in Dechis Amesim and later on in, in Olam Abba, I'll still be accessing the light of tefillin, but not necessarily by wearing black leather boxes. That's what I require right now in this physical world because I have Yitzhahar. I have an evil inclination. I have an instinctual body 
that wants to take the comfort way out. And I have to fight against that. So these things help me to do that. I have to be commanded to do the right thing. I have to be, how many times would I not give tzedakah if there wasn't the mitzvah to give tzedakah? How many times would I not daven in a minion if there wasn't halacha to daven in a minion? How many times would I not keep Shabbos? I mean, would I even, would I even keep Shabbos if there wasn't a mitzvah, you know, to keep Shabbos? So today I need that. You know why? Because my body doesn't want to. So therefore, in order to get to my soul, I have a mitzvah. I have a halacha. It cuts through the, you know, the body because it's an obligation. And then there's a fear of punishment and a lack of, you know, you know connection to Kodesh Baruch or God. So that helps me. But, explains the Leshem, in your Muslim Mashiach, in the Messianic era, Kodesh Baruch is going to cancel out the Yitzhahara. He's going to shech it. It's going to be God. No more Yitzhahara. So now the body is totally subservient to the will of the soul. Whatever you want, soul, just, just let me know. I'm here to serve you. Do your thing. I now know that this is the way life is supposed to go, and I'm with you. I'm on the same page. Do I need a mitzvah anymore? No. I will naturally want to put on the film. I'll naturally want to keep Shabbos. So that's the two opinions. The opinion that says the mitzvahs will always be around is not saying that we'll have a Yitzhahara. It's just saying that, no, they're eternal concepts, so they'll always be around. The one that says, the opinion that says that they won't be mitzvahs is not saying there won't be the actions of mitzvah, just say it won't be won't need to be commandment anymore because the Yitzhahara is gone. The, Yitzhah, the command was, was only there because of the Yitzhahara to instigate it, to antagonize it. Because only when that conflict is there, right, as the Mesut Lashisharim says, the Yitzhahara and the Yitzhotov are battled continuously. And anybody who thinks it's not the case, that they, that they either, either won or there's no such battle, has already lost the battle to the Yitzhahara. Now, the famous star, the Chafetz Chaim, who got up early one morning, as he was used to, you know, used to doing, and his Yitzhahara confronted him and said to him, you know, you're an old man after all these years. Why are you still getting up this early in the morning? Come on, surely at this stage of your life, you can afford to sleep in a bit. And his answer back to the Yitzhahara was, if you're up this early in the morning, there's no reason why I should be up this early in the morning. But what was that supposed to mean? What's that? Was it a real dialogue? I don't think he actually spoke that out. He just, he's just portraying it as a dialogue because that's what goes on inside of a person. He woke up, a little voice inside said to him, sleep in for the first time. And he's saying, well, if, you're, if I'm already getting that, that how much more so I should be getting up in time you know, early you know, at this time in the morning. Because anyhow, that's how I achieve my personal fulfillment. So the trouble is, right, that you know, we grew up in a society, even in the Torah society, Without any real instruction, how many times in the course of your your chinuch, whether it was secular, whether it was religious, whatever it was, right? How many times were you ever spoken to about personal potential? How many times did your teacher ever say, "Today, class, we're going to talk about personal potential and how to access it"? How many how many courses are offered? I mean, you look at a, a curriculum. Where, where does it say, you know, how to access potential and maximize your personal greatness? So today we have self, you know, these programs that people specifically offer to be able to achieve that you know, extra curricular, extra curricular activity, and that's not part of any real college or educational program. Even in the Torah world, where we're supposed to be teaching these values, it's right there. There's almost no focus on it. Most most greatness in people either is because the, you know they're they're unique or they're after something else. You know, one day I'll be Rosh Shiva, perhaps, you know, and that's going to bring me some security in life and maybe a little cover in the end. You know. But just where people sit and they say, I want to go through all of all of the, the Babylonian Talmud, or I want to learn all of Chumash with Rashi through and through. I want to understand this so clearly so I personally can, can access my personal potential and achieve. I'm, I'm, after, I'm after personal greatness. <clears throat> not so you'll call me great, not so I can make the newspapers, not so people will make me Rosh Hashiva one day, not so I'll be the head of the shul you know, on the board or the, the president, not, not for none of that stuff, just so I can say before I leave this world 
that I'm as great as I could possibly have been, or close to it, or at least I was in the process of working on it, for me, between me and God. Because that's what God's going to ask you on Yom Adin. He's going to show you, and they say that they showed this to you right before you leave this world. He's going to show you how great you could have been and how great you actually became. It's, it's an amazing thing how many people accept mediocrity. Yeah, I'm okay yeah, with what I am, with what I've accomplished. It's, it's good enough. It puts, it puts bread on the table, right? I'm a good standing member in society. I pay my dues to the shul. What more could anyone ask from me? Well, that's the question only you can ask yourself, and then you can answer yourself in the end. Because, because that's what it means to be a Tzalem And Tzalem Lukim is that personal greatness. That's the source of inspiration. That's when a person is striving for personal greatness, when a person understands that I've got potential, I have no idea what, even what it is. It's just the most amazing, exciting thing to find out that I've got all this energy inside me that I, I'm, not, I'm not even aware of, but it's there. And, and every day I wake up in the morning and I live through my, my day and go through my, you know, I get to, it's just opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to access more of that personal greatness. Wow, that's, that's worth getting up for in the morning. That's worth living through the day for. We know, and, and you could even, just to add some spice to the whole thing, just to make it even more exciting, more liberating, right? Just ask yourself every single time that something comes up in the course of your day, you're involved in something. Even if it's the same thing you've been doing day after day after day after day after day. You know, you know it's like a, you know, the, the saying, you know, Kaddish, for example. Right? A person says Kaddish for, you know, for 11 months at least, if not 12 months, for a dead parent, a parent who's, who's died. Okay? For other relatives, it's less time, but it's, it's a, a year. You know, you're saying it three times a day, at least, if not more times. If a male who goes to shul, right? And yeah, it's, it's, you just see it's so easy to get in this pattern where here's the Kaddish, right? This is that time, right? We finished davening. Yiskadav, Yiskadav, Shemei Rabbah. And it just rolls off the mouth, rolls off the mouth, rolls off the mouth. No difference in Shachri, Mincha, Mariv. Been there, done that 10,000 times already, right? That's, that's the same Shachri. If I'm not mistaken, it's the exact same Shachri I davened yesterday. Exact same mincha, right? So it's going to get boring after a while, doesn't it? No, because the halacha says <laughs> you must look at Torah and you must look at what you're doing as if you got it for the first time today. That's that type of inspiration. And that really is what the Torah is trying to draw out of this. You know, when I say Kaddish, a person has to say, up until now, I was able to have this much intention, this much focus on Hashem. Look at the, you know, yeah, just ask a person who's saying Kaddish, what does Kaddish mean? What do the words say? It's Aramaic. You know, it's, it's not Hebrew, it's Aramaic. Right? It what do the words mean? And I, I'd, I'd be curious to know how many people can answer you on the spot and to, oh, uh, it, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, you know, you know, make, you know, Make God's name great and to sanctify His name. You know the you know the world that He created. You know that He you know He provides us with life. And how many people will have to, people have been saying Kaddish for months, if not years? How many people can actually answer that question? You know why they can't? Because it's you're just saying Kaddish. Kaddish, the same of Kaddish, is a thing. It's what the rabbis established at this point in the prayer service. You say Kaddish. These are the words. I say it. I'm done. No, every time you say those words, you're, you're praising God. You know, the main point of, of life in this world, according to Kabbalah, not even it's not even so Kabbalah, it's not Kabbalistic at all, even, but Kabbalah says it. You know, the whole point of, of being in this world is to reveal God and to praise Him. Now, that sounds very religious and all, but that's what it says. Our whole we're, we're here, right. Not to eat, not to drink, not to sleep, not to work. We do those things because we have to. We left the Garden of Eden. We're no longer at such a high level. We have to take care of our physical bodies, etc., etc. But that's what we're here to do. That's just a means to the end. But the main thing we're here to do 
is to praise God. I mean, praise him all the time. The angels praise God all the time, around the clock. And we're supposed to do the exact same thing, but sincerely. And you say Kaddish and you don't know what you're saying? How's that praise? And because that's the point of life, every time you praise God, you put another brick in your, in your Olam Haba. So there'll be people who will go to the world to come, and they're going to find the foundation only. And they're going to say, where's the rest of the house? And God's going to say to you, you know, that person, yeah, good question. We, we had the same question for you. Where's the rest of the house? You, you didn't have intention when you dove and you learned and all these different things. You goofed off. You just stay there. I'm, I'm being yelled I'm just doing, you know. And there'll be people who have one floor built and the people who have a skyscraper. Because every time they davened, every time they said Kaddish, every time they said Shachris, Minchamar, every time they benched, or at least most of the times, it was like the first time. And they said, oh, here is another opportunity to put even more intention, to be even more focused on that bracha, on that blessing. And every time you do, it praises God. And every time it praises God, it pulls light into the world that rectifies the world at the same time, elevates sparks to go and build your portion in the world to come. But you're not going to do it if you're uninspired. And it's just, what's the point? Who cares? When a person gets up in the morning and can't find inspiration, to put their life force into what they're doing, they are a slave to paro. It's a votus parach. That's what it is. You know, paro would have people grind, you know, a you know, grinding mill. They like be a, 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 a handle stuck into a wall, and they grind like this a whole day, you know, struggling, grinding, grinding the entire day. And then at the end of the day, he'd take them around the, or whoever, the slave, you know, drivers, whatever, would take them around the wall and show that they was attached to nothing. They, they were, they were they literally, you know, spinning their wheels for no reason. They were just grinding and grinding for no reason. He would, they, he wasn't, he would, he would, he would give them work that would, would collapse and build on sand. No foundation. He put it up and would collapse again. Futile, futility. That's that's he, he wanted to. That's what he wanted to feel more than the backbreaking work that he was giving. He wanted to feel that their lives were useless. He wanted to sap them of all inspiration because uninspired people are zombies in the end. So you know, what do we do instead? Okay, I'll tell you what most of society has done. They have found ways to artificially inspire. So they have all these blockbuster movies with heroes and super, superheroes, and not just heroes, but superheroes. And they don't just go and say, well, I, I want to be saved by him. They want to say, they, they say, I want to save like him. I, want to, I, would, I would like to have a red cape like that. I'd like to be able to jump in and fly and things like that and find inner forces and, and be able to do miracle, miracles. Miracle, that's a big, it's all, they're all built upon miracles. Amazing. They're all, it's all miraculous, but they won't call it a miracle. They won't get involved with the concept of God because that's religious. So instead they call it a force. Instead they call it, you know, you know, uh, whatever they call the end. But, but it's like it's the exact same thing. They just don't want to, you know, put the re religion, you know, angle to it. But it's 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 Torah life. It's right there in the Chumash. Heroes, miracles. Except the difference is, is that it, it's artificial. It's not real. So that's that's really the point. How many people in life? Are like have there been like the people on the screen on the screens every year? People are getting awards for being heroes, but it's all fake. It's not the real people. Not not they don't have these uh, powers or or credits to their name. They're just acting. How many real people? Not many. And when you get the odd occasional person who is like that, oh, it's a big deal because it is a big deal when people act nobly. When you get a story like some, some guy who realized there was a live grenade and it was either him or his buddies, and he decides to take the chance you know, to save his buddies. And even though it's the, it's the, it's the dumbest, most dangerous anti-life thing you could possibly do, we put a person like that up on a pedestal. Because somehow, somehow, somehow we know that's a great thing to do. I don't want to do it. I'm glad I didn't do it. 
No, I'm, I, you know, but I got to tell you, I'm still impressed. I'm afraid, but I'm impressed because that's the soul. That's the inspiration. That's how you beat Paro. That's how you beat Amalek, right? When a person is able to build that inspiration, what does it say about Amalek? Amalek attacks the Jewish people on their way out of Mitzrayim. Every word counts here. It's not just, you know, parenthetical, oh, by the way, it was on the way. No, no, on their way out of Mitzrayim. Specifically, he attacked. What does that mean? It means that, that they were hot, as Rashi points out. In the what does it mean? They were inspired. They left Bayad Rama with an exalted hand. They were inspired. They were elevated and lifted. And they, they, they could do anything. And they were on the same page as God, and they wanted to accomplish noble things. And then Amalek comes on Shir Korcha Baderach. He meets us along the way, and Rashi points out Korcha is Lashon of Kur. Cham Kur, hot and cold. He cooled us off. That's what Amalek does. He cools us off. You know, it's heroic, heroic to have a Muna. It's heroic to have Bitachon. When someone says, What are you going to do? How are you going to solve that crisis? Hashem's going to help. It's okay. I have no idea. But I trust. Hashem, ah, that's irresponsible. Come on, you're not being pragmatic. That's not practical. What about this? What about that? <laughs> no. I, I've decided to go with Hashem. It, this is what we're told to do. This is what Chazal, I mean, I mean, all the Sforim, all the Musr Sforim tell us, you know, why is it that we read Musr Sforim and they don't apply to us anymore today? You know, one rabbi pointed out that people read Musil, you know, once upon a time, you read Masil Shasharim, The Path of the Just by the Ramchal, and it's like, I don't know if I can finish the Sefer. It's just, I'm overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. It's like, whoa. It's like, you know, today it's like, oh, it was a good book. It was a good book. Yeah. Good. Oh, the Ramchal, yeah, it was a good book. Yeah. Yeah. I enjoyed that a lot. Right. You read the whole thing? Oh, yeah. Cover to cover. 100%. Did you change your life? Did you improve spiritually? Oh, I don't know about that. It's like, doesn't, you know, didn't. Yeah, but a person says, yeah, I'm going to take that step. I, and believe me, every fiber of my being is saying, go do it yourself. Don't rely upon God. Make the extra phone call. You know, sacrifice the spirituality for the physical. Go ahead, do that. No, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to fight against that urge, and I'm going to do the nobler thing in the end. That's heroic. That, that defeats Amalek. That defeats Paro. We live in a very uninspired world. Not uninspiring. An uninspired world. And people, they have nothing to live for. I mean, it's, it's just so confusing. They have, they're not in touch with their personal you know, greatness. They're not, no one tells them about potential and what they can be. Everyone's just focused on what they can have and how much enjoyment they can get at the expense of whatever. But for the rare individual who understands that Yitzit Mitzrayim is a work in progress. It began back then in Moshe's time, but it continues on today, all the time. Every single one of us. Every, you too must look at yourself as if you too left Mitzrayim, because you did and you, are, you still are. But you have to, to leave fully. You have to go back and get in touch with your Tzel Malukus, your godliness. The fact that you are great in your own personal way. And then look at what you could do in the course of your life to access that, that greatness. How even the most mundane activities, how much more so the less mundane activities, are really just a pathway to be able to access that potential, to use it, to bring it to the world, and do such nobler things and become personally greater. That is exhilarating. There's nothing more inspiring than that. And that's why Para wanted to crush it. And Amalek wanted to stifle it, to snuff it out. That's the Pintal Yid, that's the Tzal whatever you want to call it. But that's ultimately what we're working on specifically during this time, Sphere of Omer until Shavuos. It's connected all one period of time. Pesach didn't really end. It just went into a different mode, a different phase, a different level called Sphere of Omer, which is all about Midas, rectifying your, your character traits and becoming greater. But ultimately, 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 the Torah was given to us to make us great, like God. And if you want to be able to, you know, to leave this world knowing 
that you have done what you're here to do, you have to come from that angle. You have to be, acknowledge that I can be great in my own right. In my own right. Now let me go figure out how to go do that. That's that's the source of inspiration. That is the exhilaration of life. Anyhow, thank you very much for joining this series of discussions. I hope that it was uh, meaningful and inspiring, uplifting. As Hashem, and uh, we should be zeichet to achieve that type of freedom because not much time left in history. We're in, I don't know how much you know how many more times a person, if at all, can reincarnate to be able to achieve what we're here in the first place to accomplish. So we're here now. We have to get it right now. And God willing, we'll, we'll have that insight, that clarity to be able to accomplish that and great things and inspire and inspire others in the process. Because ultimately speaking, this world is made up of two groups of people, the inspired and those who inspire. Well, in, those who need inspired. The, those people who are inspired, who inspire, and those people who need to be inspired. But we all go back and forth. There are times that we need to be inspired, and there's times that we can be inspiring. So, you know, we have to first become inspired ourselves, and then we can inspire others.